Hello, good morning, and thank you for joining us today um, here in the room very early on a Saturday morning and hopefully online as well in a better time zone. Um, we're here for the session Take on Voices, a Safer World for the Truth, and we'll be speaking about journalist safety and press freedom today. I have uh, several guests joining me. Um, and we'll go into uh, different countries, different regions, and uh, speak about the topic. And um, uh, we'll see some clips from two documentaries that were made about journalist safety in uh, Afghanistan and India. And um, I'll tell a bit more about myself first. My name is Evelyn Wijkstra. I am, uh, work at Free Press Unlimited, which is a media development organization based in Amsterdam. We support journalists and independent media in more than 40 countries across the world. And unfortunately, we have seen the last couple of years how uh, dire the situation for journalists has gotten. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about that today. Uh, first, I'll ask my first two guests to join me on stage, uh, Anu and Ilias. Please join me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, Anu, let me start with you. Yes. Anu Sumana uh, Netar, she's my colleague from Free Press Unlimited. She works in the Gender Safety and Accountability Team, and you work on South Asia, uh, South, uh, Asia mostly. Yes. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Um, let's start very basic. Uh, what's the situation for journalists and independent media in the region you work on? Uh, thank you, Evelyn. This is a very important question. Just to give a picture of the region, on, um, in a world context, uh, on, the, on the RSF index, South Asian countries rank very low. Uh, this, this is not good news, of course. Yeah. Um, the International uh, Federation for Journalists, they recorded about 25 media rights violations just in a span of one month this wow. year yeah. in the region, which included five detentions and a killing of a journalist. So <clears throat> it's... Uh, it's quite uh, um, important that uh, independent journalism um, exists, but this is becoming more and more difficult because of harsh regulations and laws. Yeah. Throughout South Asia, uh, media is linked with businesses and politics, um, and there is a lack of trust within the, within the population. Um, but like I said, because of the laws and regulations, journalists are not able to exercise um, uh, free journalism, uh, because it looks like there is a push mm. to make only the state narrative count. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so th today we'll talk a bit more about India and mm -hmm. the situation there. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? What's the situation for journalists, independent media? How are they able to do their job? What type of threats they are faced with? Um, has it changed over the years or is it pretty uh, stable or not? Mm -hmm. The situation in India is quite similar to uh, the situations in other countries in the region. There are new laws that are uh, being introduced. There are new clauses that are being added to guidelines to just make it more difficult for journalists to report against the governments. Yeah. Um, for example, uh, in Bangladesh, um, in 2021 alone, there were over a thousand journalists that were charged yeah. simply under the Digital Security Act. Whereas in comparison, in 2020, there were about 100 journalists. Yeah. In India... So that's um, a really steep increase in the use and or kind of the misuse of these laws against journalists. Absolutely. And, and do you see also that this is a type of journalist that they are targeting specifically with these lawsuits? Or is it really broad? Is it anyone who's critical? Um, it's anybody that is critical and um, does investigative journalism um, on government affairs. Yeah. And uh, just to uh, also throw some light on India, there are um, new clauses that have been introduced to uh, the media accreditation guidelines. One of such clauses is, um, is if a journalist um, writes about uh, um, government affairs, it can be considered as... Um, going against the sovereignty and integrity of uh, India. Yeah, exactly. And his accreditation can be revoked. So there is a, a very hard push on journalists that are um, going into investigative journalism yeah. and writing on government affairs. Exactly. And um, do you see that this is uh, a typical group of people? So these are really the, the courageous type of people that are able to still do that job? Um, 
we see that it's, uh, the number is reducing uh, yep. steadily and it is uh, very important now that we provide a good support and a support exactly. base, yep. um, including the international community. Um, there are online harassments uh, from the troll armies. Yep. A good example is Rana Ayub, an yep. Indian journalist, uh, who was intimidated. She received uh, death and rape threats. There was something called a SLAP, which is a strategic lawsuit against public participation. Mm. Uh, she uh, she received a travel ban, yeah. um, and there are. So uh, they're really trying to make it really hard for her to do this job and to be critical of of the government or yes. whoever she's trying to hold to account. Yes, yeah. um, correct. And there are also um, any critique that that is made from a journalist is received by uh, trolling techniques. Yeah. And there's a huge campaign that goes uh, against them. Yeah. Uh, it's also quite common uh, in Pakistan, where the leaders and politicians, uh, they vilify journalists. They call them peddlers of fake news. Yeah. Um, their entire research and work is discredited um, yeah. on Twitter, on social media, by politicians and leaders, which makes it more uh, look like more... Uh, yeah, it has more weightage when yeah. our readers look at it. Exactly. Yeah, you must be very uh, strong uh, and and very, I think, uh, willing to give up a lot of things to to do this type of journalism. I mean, if you look at Rana, the level of harassment she's faced with on a daily basis, it's um, yeah. I think it's it's very hurtful, and I think it's very. Uh, I think she even said she was at the Perugia Journalism Festival this week, and she said herself, you know, I. I continue to do this job, but at the same time, as a person, it hurts me. Of course, I feel it, you know, at, at times that it's it's really offensive and you feel yes. you start to doubt yourself and what you're doing. So, uh, yes, absolutely. And how can we support them? You know, you know that, that's what we work on, of course. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can say a bit more about this. How can we support those journalists and those media and still continuing their work? Yes, um, Free Press Unlimited has um, an emergency support fund where we support uh, journalists in dire need of support. There are legal funds um, also available at Free Press Unlimited. And some of our partners in Pakistan, they also have uh, locally set up uh, legal funds. Yeah. Um, we as Free Press Unlimited also uh, train journalists on uh, digital and physical security. We provide uh, psychosocial support. Yeah. Uh, That's because very much needed, of course, in these situations where yeah. if you're, you're confronted with this type of trolling that you're not isolated and you, uh, uh, you get the support that's needed. That Precisely. Time. I yeah. think we undermine the, the trauma, the PTSD that journalists um, uh, face. And especially in Corona, uh, journalists have seen, especially in India, people dying uh, in front of hospitals because of lack of oxygen. So that has uh, really pushed the journalists into a lot of pressure and we also uh, read that some journalists um, committed suicide. So uh, a good support base in the country and outside is very important, and it's, uh, it, it calls for international support, uh, lobbying uh, for uh, better regulations, yeah. and, and also to uh, call out the governments and hold them accountable. Yeah, exactly, to not uh, use that type of rhetoric about journalists when they uh, speak up. Thank you so much. It was very clear. Ilias, uh, you're a filmmaker from Afghanistan. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what's the situation in Afghanistan for filmmakers like yourself, but also journalists? I, I heard you're a former journalist. Um, what's the situation now? I think everyone has heard about the Taliban takeover and the effect of that. Um, but I think everyone's now turned to Ukraine, where the new crisis erupted. So it would be good to hear what's the situation now. Thank you, thank you, Evelyn. But I'm afraid I can say Afghanistan is in a total media blackout at the moment. There is no actual reporting, there is no ground reporting coming from Afghanistan. And uh, it's, uh, uh, and at the same time, the narrative that the Taliban and the pro Taliban media pushes somehow tackles even this vulnerable. Uh, um, situation that's already been there. Yeah. So since the well, I left uh, Kabul in July 2021, and when I left, I could count uh, tens of journalists and tens of uh, uh, media activists and writers who are back there in the country and who are writing and who are trying to raise awareness. But uh, um, in the blink of an eye, 
we just lost a generation of, yeah. of journalists who were shaped there. Exactly. So based on Human Rights Watch, on September 2021, around 40% of the local media was closed. Uh, and 80% of female journalists uh, lost their job. And uh, mm, so this data might have uh, changed until now yeah. and uh, changed to worse, I can say. Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, I can say that there were three channels of reporting back then, uh, the local media, the international media, and the social media, mm. the community who were actually reporting. Uh, what happened with uh, the uh, local media is that uh, they are facing uh, restrictions and they are facing uh, uh, lots of new rules and laws by the yeah. Taliban that uh, um, disables them to actually report from what's going on. Yeah, I and believe the, they, they introduced certain rules for the media uh, quite soon after their uh, takeover and these were quite mm -hmm. fake, right? I yeah, mean, they were anything that's critical or anything that's... In, in, in September 2021, like uh, uh, not even a month after they, they captured Kabul, they sent uh, out newsletters to all the uh, uh, media inside Afghanistan, and uh, uh, there were like clauses in, in, in that letter which is very vague, like uh, the media can't uh, uh, accuse and media can't report about any facts that may uh, somehow... Um, may affect the, the picture of the yeah, Taliban and, exactly. and, and may affect uh, what they call the values. So, uh, and, and a, a few media that are currently operating inside Afghanistan, they are like very limited in terms of resources and they also, they are afraid of, of the security of their staff and their equipment. Yeah. So basically, all the news that they reflect is somehow controlled by the Taliban. So the um, and, and there's when I say there is no real reporting, it mm. means that we don't have journalists actually looking out for facts and looking out for stories. No. But they rather wait for the Taliban to hold a news conference or something, and to somehow reflect and react on on the on the uh, propaganda and on the yeah. uh, on the uh, uh, reports that the Taliban either confirm or deny. <coughs> yeah, exactly. The international media, unfortunately. Uh, um, we have a long story with international media as a hub of uh, war journalists for at least the past uh, 40 years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, as the new generation, think that uh, the mainstream media uh, has somehow shaped the narrative of Afghanistan and shaped the narrative of the war even. So we never owned our own narrative. But even uh, uh, all the there was at least international media present who would uh, observe the things happening here, which is now very limited, I can say. Yeah. Uh, all uh, international media can do is they can interview Taliban fighters who are actually very attractive sometimes for them, uh, looking at these uh, uh, faces with these traditional clothes and AK-47s who have defeated the US, mm. um, attracts international media in a sense that uh, it puts the rest of the country in, in, in a blackout. Yeah, and it's then not about the people's <coughs> issues, it's about you know covering what's interesting for their audiences and, and kind yeah, of... Yeah, well, it's really interesting having these uh, uh, heavily armed uh, local fighters in the streets of, of vibrant Kabul, yeah. and, and that's what they uh, uh, focus on. Them. And that's actually yeah. what Taliban also want them to focus. They want to be seen, and at the same time, uh, uh, Whenever an international journalist wants to uh, try to report from Afghanistan, they are somehow directed, led to specific channels, led to specific resources that the Taliban may have uh, already arranged that for yeah, them. So uh, uh, there is no like freedom of movement for them. Uh, and then the social media, um, there was a, a wave of, of community reporting. There was a wave of 
of Afghan citizens reporting about the issues, which shaped the, the whole bulletin of, of every day's news in, 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 in the uh, local media, I can say. Um, we had a very strong and we had a very active social media platforms in Afghanistan, which is now uh, dying, I can say, mm. because those who are inside the country, they really, they fear of their lives and they can't report. And those who are outside like us, we don't really have access to the resources yeah. and to the stories happening back there. Yeah, exactly. So all these elements gathered together to, to put this country in a total media blackout okay. yeah. where we don't know what is actually happening there. Yeah, exactly. And do you see, are there any um, exiled media, so actually newsrooms that have gone out and started to um, make their media and their content from abroad mm -hmm. um, going into the country again, or is that not happening mm -hmm. yet? Um, I know a few uh, uh, media outlets that have uh, shifted to outside the country and they are uh, operating from exile, like uh, my colleague Zaki Dariobi from uh, one of the uh, most read newspapers inside Kabul. Um, but then it's also about the question of access. When, when you don't have uh, uh, physical access to yeah. the stories, uh, it's really difficult to report. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And for you, like, what is your, do you uh, envision yourself going back to Afghanistan in the, in the coming period? Are you, are you not sure about that? Uh, that is what I, I, I dream of <laughs> uh, almost every morning, but... Uh, it's a political decision, I can say. Uh, the decision that we left the country was also a political decision. Yeah. Beside the threat on our lives, uh, we didn't want to uh, stay on the same country and stay on the same streets and valleys that are occupied by a terrorist group. Of so course. on that regard, uh, uh, turning, going back to the country is also a political decision to make. Uh, but nevertheless, that's our country, and, and uh, uh, we as filmmakers and journalists uh, need to be there and need to uh, tell stories and, and access the stories there, but it's going to be very difficult for us. And right now, there is no hope no. To, to, to actually go and, and film and report from there. No, exactly. Well, thank you so much, both. Uh, I think this was a good introduction to the topics we're going to discuss more today. Um, thank you for being thank here. You, thank, thank you, Evelyn. Thank you. I think we're going to see a short uh, clip from a documentary by uh, Saki Dariabi, who is a filmmaker and journalist from uh, Afghanistan, and who we'll talk to uh, shortly after that. حاکم ایستی اطلاعات روز از نمی شرایط بحرانی خود را نجات می دهد. وقتی می ماند اگر حتی این کار از خود ممکن نباشد از یک سر دیگر این ها در حتما حفظی کنید. جنگیان سرمست از توزی هرچند سیاه و سفیدشان را برد فاشد. به نظرم که امی یکی دو روز آینده را دفتر نباشی بهتر شور اگر اتفاق اگر حضور تون دفتانه انفجار پوشش داده، جنگ پوشش داده، کسایی را که ما این کارا و جنایت هایشان را پوشش داده بودیم مطمئن مطمئن میکوشن دیگه ما فعلا نگرانی است که یک دفعه از اینجا براییم که نمانیم و وضعیت به یک جایی نرسه که مثلا زندگی در خطر باشه خب طرف هایتون نامد طالبا چک نکرد؟ گوالا در کچه دیگه میگه که آمده آتوالی طرف نامده صدای شلیک میه خیلیم نزدیکه احساس نمو کنی خیلی کار جسورانه ای کردی که امروز آمدی سر کار؟ نه کار جسورانه نیه حق ابتدایی میم یعنی چی کار جسورانه؟ <تصفح> دانشگاه خاندم، مکتب خاندم، هاگنجی وظیفه گرفتیم یادم کل اگه نسیسی فرشورو کس خانه بیدیم نشو دیگر 
دیگه ما شاهدی چی نیست رنگ های متنوع تیپ های متنوع تصفیه ایدئولوژی علمی است ایدئولوژی میخواد همه چیز یک دست میدونی من این فیریس دویش آماده کرده مگر با مشکل بر نخره یعنی در نفر اول را میری مایست که از کابل یه هفته بیرون شد من یکی ده استاد چی دونزگاه تکیه کده نه در وقت پرواز خواهی همه باید بیشینه آه فوتوشاپ نیمی؟ آه نه 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 مگه فقط یک شو تا سه سوک خلوت میشه که از او حجوم و هم همه و وحشت یک مقدار کم میشه هنگه هنگه زمید دارین که خروش کنیم؟ هنگه میده است میده باقی است بریم جلی یه پیشنهاد یک مقدار پوشش بیشتر دیم و یک مقدار چایش بیشتر دیم اطلاعات روز اگر اون شجاعت نداشته باشم اگر محتوی تولید نکنه یا گزارش ها و تحلیل منتشر نکنه که یک مقدار آگاهی بخش باشه یک مقدار آگاهی خلق کنه در جامعه دیگه در حقیقت او اطلاعات روز وجود نه برای اطلاعات روز و خواب محتوی شکسته هر بیش یکسان است ما می گفتیم که ما خبرنگاریم و با یک نوع تحقیر می گفتن فیلم برداری می کنیم حالا دیدیم فیلم برداری چطوره ترس از یکی ما رو بکشه هر لحظه ما رو خفه می کرد نمی توانستیم نفس بکشم گوشیم را حس می کردم که از بین رفته چون کار نمی کرد اصلا نمی شنیدیم و نمی توانستیم با پهلوی راست بخونیم بایدیم می خواهیم بگویم که اطلاعات روز حالش خوب نیست جبهه مقاومت ملی به زودی سخنگوی جدید خود اعلان نموده و بار دیگه اعلان میکنه که شهادت افتخار ماست و به هیچ عنوان شهید دادن و همچنین فشارهای بالای جغرافیا آوردن از روحی ما نمیکاهد هر اتفاق ممکن است ما باید یاد نجات بودیم صادقانه احساسی ناتوانی میکنم که اگر کار نکنم بعد از ده سال کار میخواییم ای اتفاق بیفته و کارهای ما بیرون بره Hi, Saki. Thank you for joining us. I think it's the middle of the night for you, so I hope you can hear us well. Thank you. Uh, we just watched a small clip from the documentary about your, uh, your independent uh, uh, newspaper uh, back in Kabul uh, last August, I believe. Um, how are you now? Hello, everyone. Just seen the short clip. Uh, it uh, just bring a lot of memories that I passed through many months in Kabul, and absolutely in a decade that I was in Kabul as a journalist. Yeah, I can imagine this must be uh, painful as well. Um, you set up the newspaper, the independent newspaper, Eti La Truce, uh, I think more than 10 years ago. Um, you probably did not imagine this happening, of course. Uh, why did you set up the, the newspaper back then? Uh, I just want to say that uh, it's a decade that Eti La Truce is working as independent newspaper in the country. 
after a decade that we were active in the country and after a two decade of presence of international community, the government collapsed in Afghanistan, but the journalism and independent media didn't collapse. Uh, I see that every day there's a lot of reports coming from the country, across the country, every provinces in many outlets include digital outlets. I didn't know that how long does it take that uh, we can reactive again with the authors. And now uh, I see that uh, every day we have a lot of free reports across Afghanistan, include many provinces. When I was in Kabul, we just had four uh, uh, provincial, provincial uh, journalists, but now we have more than 10. And that's why I'm telling that uh, government collapsed, but the media didn't collapse. Uh, I see that there's uh, the, we just changed the, the activities in uh, some kinds of reports. But uh, I know that it's a long way for independent media and journalists, but we will rise again in your uh, 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 we are working to uh, active again what we were before, investigative reports, storytelling, video journalism, and many things. But now I see that a lot of uh, my colleagues and other journalists are uh, in danger and they are not sustainable. And we are looking to find a way for the future of journalism that will be sustainable uh, more than what we see now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you need to survive, of course, financially as well to, to do the work. Um, in, the, in the small clip, we saw that you were saying, no, I hope I can get my colleagues out, these people that have worked for us for, for a long time. Did they manage to go out? No, unfortunately, I defeated on that. Yeah. Uh, many of them got out, but many of them are still in Kabul. Many of them are still in provinces. Uh, they are very famous, uh, include many good investigative reports, uh, reporters, and I defeated on that. Yeah. Exactly. And you, so they still are able to do the work, but not in the same way as before. Do I understand that correctly? So they're still reporting? Some of them working with Italatros, but some of them uh, just uh, lift the organization because they feel that it's my fault and I couldn't do uh, something for them to evacuate them. But I think it was uh, the, a lot of technical things. It was not on my hand. No. So uh, I, I, just, uh, I, I just need to make a decision. Then we just started to hire some new journalists, but anonymous people, because the, the, everything has changed. So many of the journalists who are working with Italy authors, we didn't share their names and they work with us anonymously. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you say, I do see some hope for the future because there's still some journalism alive. And uh, uh, I think after a decade, you've also uh, grown a medium, you've grown a culture of journalism as well and a culture of uh, speaking out. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the hope you see and what you hope that will happen uh, in, in the, the coming period? The first thing that I see as a hope it was this, is this, that uh, the government with a lot of money just collapsed in Afghanistan. But journalism during a hard time in the past months, while there was a lot of torture of journalism, they detained journalism, they try to destroy the infrastructure, infrastructure for the media and freedom of expression in Afghanistan. And they try to bring a lot of restriction against media. They just ignore the law, but we still have uh, a lot of reports uh, from Afghanistan, from the national media. Uh, 
So this is the first one. Then the second is, uh, while many of my colleagues are trying to just leave Afghanistan, we every day face with a lot of requests that are trying to be uh, freelance journalists for Etelatros in many other media organizations. There's a lot of women and also the men that are trying to help the media. Then we receive a lot of uh, reports from the citizens. Then uh, they are trying to, uh, uh, to share their voice in the story of Afghanistan through national media, international media. In, they're trying to be part of uh, uh, a, a big, uh, a big uh, narrative that we fought for in past two decades. And I see that there's a lot of hopes, but unfortunately it's not sustainable if we don't have a support for international community, especially uh, the organizations who fight for freedom of expression and they're trying to support this. I, I see that uh, 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 many organizations just uh, left Afghanistan. The organization who found the media, who just supported the uh, freedom of expression in Afghanistan, but they just left, Afghan they just left the country. Mm. I, I think uh, we need uh, the support, and it's very important to yeah. be a backbone for freedom of expression in Afghanistan. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, is there any sign that they will be returning these organizations, or is that very unclear still? Because that's that's I I think it's also a call for us to speak to them. I uh, from from my organization, Free Press Unlimited, we have kept saying again and again we shouldn't only focus on getting people out of Afghanistan, but we should also focus on you know ensuring that there is a free flow of information, that there's still journalists supported to do the work. So exactly what you're saying now, we need to ensure that all of this investment and also kind of the culture that was created, which is seen now with actually citizens engaging also with you and telling the stories that that should be maintained. And um, uh, I think that's something, I, I take that as a clear cue for us to also keep on saying and don't forget that that, that is really necessary. Um, but is, do you feel like these organizations are listening to that uh, already, the ones that were inside the country and doing this work? Or did they leave and they just wait for, for any stable government? Because I think that's also an issue with you know, a lot of the governments that we deal with, that they're saying, you know, we don't want to engage with the Taliban. So that makes it very hard to actually you know, uh, go back into the country, start an embassy again. But at the same time, it's, you leave the people, of course, and how it's, it's a hard balance to strike, I think. Yeah, that's why I'm here, to ask that Philippe is unlimited, at least uh, come to Afghanistan. It's time that you should come to Afghanistan because digital security in the way that we face now is important that you should come in Afghanistan. Yeah. I, as editor-in-chief, uh, didn't know uh, does free, free Press Unlimited was in Afghanistan or not, but it's time that you should come to help the journalists and the media organizations. And we also call every other uh, organizations that work for, free press, uh, for freedom of expression. Then I see that uh, many journalists, editor in chiefs, and who just left Afghanistan are trying to collaborate with each other uh, to convince the world and to work together to uh, help the local journalists and to keep the flow of information alive from Afghanistan and to. Uh, be a kind of backbone for what we achieved uh, in the area of freedom of expression in the past two decades. So I'm hopeful that uh, we can arrange to uh, convince the organizations that what we achieved in Afghanistan for freedom of expression in the independent media is very, very important. So uh, what 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 what's rise in Afghanistan in the area of uh, free media 
It is uh, uncomparable with a lot of countries. Mm. Uh, the government, the politicians can lose everything, uh, but we, as a field for freedom of, of expression, should not let that what we achieved in Afghanistan be alone. Exactly. Yeah. With a dictatorship government, with uh, a government that didn't respect the law, didn't understand what's freedom of expression. Mm. But I think uh, we can manage together, and I'm hopeful. Great. We'll uh, make sure to support you in that. Um, just to make sure, we're, we're going to open up for questions after, but I think it might be nice for you to go back to sleep. So if there's any questions for Zaki at this time, please uh, post those at, at this time. I'm not able to see anyone, but is there a mic if that's necessary? I don't believe there's any. Thank you so much, Saki, for joining us, and uh, I wish you good luck with the documentary. I, I look forward to seeing the whole uh, version, and uh, let's be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll switch to India now. We'll start by watching a small clip of the documentary by Kavita Lankesh, who's here today, and we will join me on stage after that. well-known journalist Gauri Lankesh has been shot dead at her home in Bangalore. The For Gauri, I think uh, this was a natural transition, you know, her involvement in the Baba Bungiri issue. It just couldn't have been otherwise. When she was actually working in the national media, the English language newspaper in Delhi, she had covered the events leading to the demolition of Babri Masjid, which, as we all know, is a watershed moment in the rise of the right wing in India. That was in 1992. Eight years later, when our father died in 2000, uh, Gauri came back to her home state uh, in Karnataka and took over Lankesh Patrike, which my father used to run. Reluctantly, I must say, but she was compelled to. Now, Gauri here also saw the same pattern of events happening in Baba Bungiri, trumpeted as the Ayodhya of South by the right wing. And Lankesh Patrike had the legacy of actively being in opposition to any ruling government. So when she started running the paper and with all the other events happening around her, she jumped right into the thick of the events. That is what I mean by saying it was completely natural for her, you know. She couldn't have uh, remained just an observer. Uh, that's why she became so passionately involved in it. Uh, we have of Karnataka people from the Harmony Forum. Then we are asking for, let there be harmony and peace, that we are arrested. And the very fascist forces which are out to destroy the uh, secular fabric of the state have, have been allowed to uh, carry on their parade and uh, uh, everything else in the city of Chikmangalore today. But this is a fight we have been doing for the last four years and we are determined that at, you know, come what may, we will not allow the communalization of the state. In 2005, uh, if I'm not mistaken, here in Karnataka, we saw a series of violent attacks against the minorities, especially Christians and Muslims. Uh, in 2008, uh, 20 churches were vandalized by people from these organizations, uh, so-called organizations called Bajrangdala, Sri Ram Sene, and etc., which are Hindu right-wing mobs claiming to be vigilante groups like the black shirts or brown shirts, you know. And surprisingly, maybe not surprising, the police were in cahoots with them. 
the police were beating up christians instead of uh, controlling the mobs and it was really insane and gauri was trying to be a sane voice uh, speaking for the minorities arguing with the politicians and the ministers writing furiously in the newspapers week on and week on so she gradually came to be seen as one of the leading voices in the resistance against the right wing in our home state karnataka gauri lankesh uttara kodli kaakte ella walagale kallar tara kootkondidare neeve lankesh at naam kontive aadre ಓಪನ್ಲಿ um attack her or abuse her with words transformation is such that starting from kuvempu to ura kalburgi my father they were all trenchant critics of jawaharlal nehru of indira gandhi of rajiv gandhi but let me say that none of them ever were uh, physically act- attacked let alone death threats but now death threats has become a common factor in karnataka Gauri was just not my sister she was also my best friend and a good critic of all my works you know uh, i used to make her go through all my film scripts before i started shooting and she would share her articles before it got published um, almost uh, every other weekend she would come home to spend time with us and i realized uh, that she would be spending uh, time on the computer posting her comments about uh, anti hindutva and also trying to mo- rationalize with uh, Uh, modi supporters on social media i came to know much later of course that she was being heavily abused and trolled on it because of her ideology and her belief in secularism and the constitution uh, gauri and me shared the same office building you know and so i would uh, regularly meet her almost every day except of course when i was in a shoot or uh, she was attending a numerous protests and uh, her busy was busy with her writing or attending hundreds of court uh, cases which were filed against her by the right wing gauri I, i must say was a great cook but she hardly ever cooked because she didn't want to be uh, labeled or put in a box of uh, domesticity as you would say uh, as she became more and more busy i started taking food for her every day and dropping her off at the office i really can't forget the casserole found in a car when she was assassinated that had her dinner in it still I wish I could have scolded her one last time not to forget and to eat. Ava koma sauhargakage aashista Gandhi tamma jeevanane bali kotro yava samanate sigade rohit vemula doodal patno adu namage hatashi aagbodu ಭಾರತದ ಒಂದು ಸೌಹಾರ್ದ ಮತ್ತು ಸಮಾನತೆ ದೇಶ ಕಟ್ಟೋದಕ್ಕೆ ನಮ್ಮ ನಾವೆಲ್ಲರೂ ಪಣ ತೊಡೋಣ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳ್ತೀನಿ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನನ್ನ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಅನೇಕ ಅನೇಕ ಗೌರಿಯರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಸರಿ ಮಾಡಿ 
ನನ್ನ ಮಗಳು ಪಿ ಯು ಸಿ ಆದಮೇಲೆ ಇಂಜಿನಿಯರ್ ಆಗಲಿ ಅಂತ ಆಸೆ ಇತ್ತು ನನಗೆ ಪತ್ರಿಕೋದ್ಯಮ ಆರಿಸ್ಕೊಟ್ಲು ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಫುಲ್ಲು ನ್ಯಾಯ ಒದಗಿಸಿಕೊಟ್ಲು ಅವಳಂತ ಗೌರಿಯವ್ರನ್ನ ಹುಟ್ಟಾಕಿದ್ಲು ಧೈರ್ಯದಿಂದ ಹೋರಾಡೋಕ್ಕೆ ಪ್ರೇರಣೆ ಮಾಡಿದ್ಲು ನನಗೆ ಹೆಮ್ಮೆ ನಿಮ್ಮೆಲ್ಲರ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಹೆಮ್ಮೆ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಗೌರಿ ನೀವು ನನ್ನ ಗೌರಿಯರು ಎಲ್ಲ ನನ್ನ ಗೌರಿಯರು ಅಷ್ಟೇ Now, 18 people have been charged with the murder. So far, 16 have been arrested and two accused are still absconding. Now, this charge sheet elaborates on the involvement of right-wing organizations, Sanatan Sansta, and names Parshuram Vagmare as the prime accused who is said to have shot her. Headquartered in Goa, the organization has offices in Panvel, Mumbai, Sangli and other parts of Maharashtra. Members affiliated to the group have been accused of carrying out bomb blasts, murder, issuing threats and even transporting explosives. We took up the investigation on the 6th evening itself. I visited first in the 6th evening and then from 7th onwards we started visiting the scene of offense and we started collecting all the data and evidence which were there on the scene of offense. Discount because there were no initial suspects, we could not discount. We had to create a sub-investigation team to looking at each of them, like looking, looking at the CCTV camera footage of uh, nearly 5 to 10 kilometers in and around bank. Similarly for phone calls, separate uh, team, separate computers, uh, separate programming, only for this case. I imagine the data of 15 days of entire Bangalore city. It is humongous. It's four years since Gauri is gone. And in 2019, two years after they killed Gauri, Mr. Modi's government was elected for another term and the right wing's power was uh, kind of cemented. Just like my sister, Many, many more journalists have been killed over the years and the media is being silenced again and again. We have the highest number of journalists killed in 2021, which is quite uh, scary and deplorable. And I don't know what it says about our freedom of press. The Freedom House, uh, which is a US-based organization, has downgraded India from a free democracy to a partial democracy. You know? I Along with this, of course, the religious polarization, lynching and violence in the name of religion everywhere. It's a very grim situation. But I know if Gauri was here, she wouldn't have thought of it like that. Gauri was a very positive person, you know. She, was, she would only see hope in the numerous resistance all across the country, like the nationwide protest against the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, which is an act that brought in a religion-based criteria for citizenship of the country. And then there was the farmers' movement against the new farm laws, which they wanted to leave the farmers at the mercy of uh, big corporate companies. I'm sure she would have been there. This movement went on for one whole year before forcing Mr. Modi to backtrack on the farm laws. Yeah, I'm sure Gauri would have loved to be there. She would have been in the streets, writing, reporting, investigating furiously, seeing hope, where many of us could only probably see despair. Maybe that was the idea when they killed her, to kill hope itself. Kafita, please join me on stage. Hi, Evelyn. Hi. Hi. Kafita, you made a beautiful documentary about your sister. Yeah. Thank uh, you. It must be also touching to see that again and again, I feel. <laughs> it's so personal and it's... Uh, yeah, but um, le where to start? Um, I believe you say in the documentary uh, for your sister, uh, the constitution was her religion. Yeah. Where did this come from? I think uh, basically because uh, 
we were brought up under Mr. Lanke, S.P. Lanke, who was my father, who believed in the Constitution more than anything else, and he was believed in secularism. He respected every religion. He he wanted peace. He wanted, uh, you know... I mean, we grew up in that kind of culture where there was theatre, films, literature. Yeah. So we were never against a particular religion or we didn't see any hatred or any polarisation. And I think it was a much more safer and uh, secular and beautiful world back then, I think. I mean, when my father, uh, you know, he used to bring down governments through his writings, especially his newspaper was very, very popular in the 80s, 90s. And... Uh, he was always, but in fact, he was never for any particular government as such. He always did his job as a journalist, as an opposition party, you know. Yeah. His newspaper did that job and he was very, very popular. Mm. And so we came in that culture and Gauri, in fact, followed his footsteps and his, ide- her, his idealism, I think, in her newspaper as well. Mm, so. <laughs> and was that the same for you? Is that why you chose to be a filmmaker? Or? Absolutely, I think so. I think we were surrounded by, as I told you, People like Girish Karna or Ayur Anant Murthy, who was a stalwart writer on the theater, all these people were around us all the time when we were growing up. So, we, in fact, uh, my father, you know, it was very funnily I say, he never gave us any money for clothes or anything like that at that time. But we were a very, very middle class or under that. But even in spite of that, he would give us a blank check to go to, you know, bookshop and buy books. So <laughs> that, I think, uh, opened up a whole new world for us. Yeah. I and mean, I think that's very important to read. And Gauri and me, in fact, would never uh, go to bed without reading a book every night. Yeah. You know, so we, 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 yeah, we grew up in that culture, I think. Yeah. yeah. Great. So. Great. Yeah. And um, so this November, it's it's five years ago that your sister was September, uh, assassinated. Yeah. Oh, September, September 5th, 5th. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you, I think in a documentary, you say, I never expected this to happen to her. Yeah. Um, uh, what has been the effect on you that this has happened? No, see, as again, as I told you, even when my father was writing and bringing down governments or exposing every corruption, there was hardly any threats at that time, you know. The maximum some would probably was do was protest in front of our office or pelt some stones at the office kind of thing. Mm. So, in fact, me and my father would go for walks or he never, ever had a bodyguard in his life and nothing like that. And when Gauri was, uh, in, in fact, people around her, told us there might be some threats for her life, or not really life, but maybe somebody would try attack her. She laughed it off. And when mm. even, I mean, I laughed it off because I always thought she was not as big as my father because I knew, uh, she, you know, she was she was not just a journalist because my father was mainly a journalist. Gauri, I think, had transcended to become an activist as well. Yeah. You know, she got down on the streets, whatever she wrote, she would stand with the people's issue and make sure she would intervene with the government, with the people, yeah. and bring, you know, uh, bring some action possible from the government. Yeah, That's exactly. what she did. She took a f- f- step further from my father, I think. Yeah, it was so, not only covering yes, the story, yes. but actually trying to get the change done right. that she covered. Right, not just in the journalistic way or writing about informative way. Yeah. But she stood for every issue. I mean, I, I remember in the documentary, the complete documentary, where she had actually fought for, uh, you know, the for, uh, land rights for people in the forest. So there were some 3,000 people evacuated at that time, and she went and fought... I mean, stood with them with the issues and she intervened with the government. And after she went away, after three years, when I went to shoot this documentary, mm-hmm. I realized they had built about a thousand houses for them. So this is what she was fighting for and yeah. she made sure it happened. So that is a, a beautiful part of Gauri, I think. Definitely, yeah. that's very admirable. Yeah. Um, you kind of touched upon this already, but yeah. there was a difference between the type of journalist that your father was and that Gauri was. Yeah. Do you think that actually, because she took that extra step, did that make her more of a target? I think so, in a way, because also she was much more closer to the people, because it was not just standing by and writing about it, but she also went, as I told you, stood with the people, yeah. voicing out. I mean, she went would call protest, me every right? other day, every other week. She would, in fact, sit on the... There was a, a place called Town Hall in Bangalore with this, you know, steps, and they would go to protest there. And she would be there at least weekly once, or she would go to various parts of Karnataka with the issues of the people. And also one more thing, I had in fact asked um, the same question if she was a threat because she was writing for the regional paper, mm-hmm. not really a national paper. Yeah. Somehow regional paper, I think, was uh, it got people to be more closer 
to what she was talking about yeah, so the local people would know what she was talking about whereas a national paper would address probably only the elite exactly. english reader yeah it's further away you know. from so this got her more to the grassroots yeah people and that's where they could understand what the issues were about so i think she was a i mean absolutely a threat because of that as yeah, well yeah exactly yeah. um in the in the documentary there's also a small and i think also in the clip we just saw there's a small portion about the investigation yeah. um how is that for you as a sister was it uh, um is it to you did it serve justice in your view or was there um i mean there can never be justice of yeah. course when your sister is killed but did they do you think they found the people that actually did this or is that still unclear it's, it's it i mean ever since she was assassinated after that this third day the uh, there was a sit formed with a 100 strong team from the karnataka, karnataka government at that point and i have been in touch with the investigation team week every week or to every fortnight once till today in fact and in fact i'm happy that uh, I know there's never be justice and there'll never be Gauri coming back, of course. But the SIT team did a wonderful job because of the kind of meticulous investigation they did, in spite of it being a very, very tough case. Yeah. Because of the meticulous job they did, it's not just Gauri's case that was uh, kind of solved, but also Mr. Pansare, Dabolkar and um, Kalburgi, who were also assassinated for the same reason in the same group of people. So the entire connection has come forward and uh, it's been revealed in yeah. the investigation that uh, all these murders were done by the same group of people. Yeah. So I'm happy about that, but the fight continues for me because just about three months back, I had to intervene with the Supreme Court because they were all uh, about to be, uh, you know, that some some accused were uh, had applied for bail. And if uh, they come out in Indian judicial system, I mean, it's very good, but at the same time, it's very slow because of the number of cases which are there in the court. I mean, thousands and lakhs of cases. So it's very difficult for the court to really come to here. And for after four years, finally, the last um, two days back, it was announced that the trial is going to start. And on May uh, 27th, I've been summoned to the court. And hopefully the trial uh, starts soon and... Yeah. and the accused are get their rightful punishment and uh, you exactly. know exactly yeah. yeah and um apart from this did this change your filmmaking as well obviously you made the documentary why did you decide to do that <laughs> actually i i'd been wanting to make a feature film on her and but it, of course it's uh, a much more bigger budget and much more bigger, but it's been uh, thankfully when somebody told me that uh, you know this kind of documentary is being commissioned by free, free press uh, free press unlimited i had uh, kind of both uh, whether whether to apply or not to apply itself was a big de a big decision and there was a lot of confusion because it uh, i could imagine the journey i had to go through uh, reliving gauri in a way exactly. it's been very very traumatic and half the time uh, we were, I mean, I was crying behind the scenes. Of course, yeah. You know, at the same time, I was also very proud of what she stood for because when I met the people she had, uh, she had, uh, you know, was involved with in terms of uh, the issues she fought for, uh, I was proud of the yeah. issues that she stood for. At, uh, but uh, Free Press Unlimited finally kind of selected as one of the projects to be made. And uh, I'm very happy and I, because I hope Gauri's voice... Uh, when, she, when before she died, it was very uh, local and also national. Yeah. But after she was assassinated, there has been a worldwide kind of uh, you know interest Attention. and also yeah. because it is a it's it's important the kind of p what she stood for should be heard all over the world. I think. Yeah. And I hope through Free Press Unlimited and through this documentary, which goes uh, hopefully to many more people. Yeah. Um, it changes the world because the world has become very very polarized, very very divisive and. Yeah. You know, and especially now in Karnataka, what we are facing, it's been so communal in the last few months. So I hope, and as you know, this kind of uh, fascist kind of regime and the mentality is filling all over the world, I think. And I hope this documentary can make a slight difference yeah. to get into more humanitarian values and issues that are more important. Definitely. You know? yeah. That's really what she stood for. Eh? Yes, like she, she was seen as opposition, but what she actually wanted was more 
harmony and Absolutely. more respect and yes. more yeah exactly yes. yeah. and for you for the for the future do you think you'll um focus more on the topic of you know the the courage that journalists have and and are showing within I society think so. i yeah. think so see in a way i mean gauri's friends have always been my friends and whole involvement in that and after she's passed away it's been more so for me actually and it's also been my more involvement in the politics around and then it, my it was always my voice was through my films and right now it's much more politicized i think because of gauri and because of the kind of scenario that's happening around there's been a what can i say an awareness much more awareness in yeah. me and i hope to bring this forward you know yeah, yeah. that would be great yeah. and for the rest of your family like uh, what's been the effect of what has happened to gauri and and what what happened since is there other people who are also uh, uh more focal or more working on these types of issues absolutely i think i mean gauri's family is not just as, as i think you know it's huge because uh, even when she was assassinated and uh, when we were burying her the police uh, the team said uh, can just her f- close family come forward and i looked back and i saw all these people whom i think she considered more of a family than us because she would spend so much more time with them yeah. resolving issues you know being with them and you know being close to them. so this a whole f- it's not just a uh, journalist her f- family was uh, much more i mean it's cross section of people and yeah, especially beautiful. the youth as well whom she had inspired and so i think that's a whole lot and yes they continue to voice out some somebody like tista settleworld who is a close friend and a lawyer and a journalist as well i think they continue undaunted yeah. and i think that's important there are thousands of people like that and that's the hope i see otherwise i don't see much hope uh, because uh, there are all these groups around you know and, and only time you see the negative uh, um, hateful and, negative yeah. uh, you know messages or news and it's filled and this so you feel a sense of despair yeah but when i see people like uh, t store shifts in their colleagues and thousands of other people like my people who believe in secularism who believe development maybe we need to have more good roads more p- good better public health maybe better education system than all this religion based uh, bigotry i think that's where we should concentrate on and Definitely. hopefully it will happen <laughs> yeah i yeah. think that was beautiful because as actually yeah. you touched upon this you said you know um gauri always uh, saw hope and that yeah. was her motivation and yeah. i think uh, we should try to do the same yes thank you so much so. for joining thank us you. today and thank you um, uh, we look forward to to see the documentary in full and thank you, uh, thank, you. thank you so much thank you. Thank you. um so later on we'll we'll have everyone on stage and you'll be able uh, to to ask some questions for now may I ask yous to come and join me on stage Hey. Hi. Jos, uh, you're my colleague at Free Press Unlimited. Uh, you work on a project called A Safer World for the Truth. You're the research coordinator. Um, let's start with the project. What is it about? So the project um, is basically about investigating cold cases of journalist murders. So we really work at the, let's say, top of the iceberg of repression of, of journalists. And uh, what we aim to do by investigating these cold cases is contributing to hopefully preventing such murders to take place um, in the future. Exactly, yeah. Uh, we saw, of course, I think it was really telling the end of the, the documentary by Kavita, uh, perhaps by murdering Gauri, they also tried to murder basically Hope. And uh, unfortunately, I think there is a lot of truth in that beyond uh, the case of Gauri and even India yeah. uh, what we see in many contexts is that um, there's good reasons to believe that these acts of repression murder are really aimed at uh, not just murdering one person not just silencing one person but really send out a message to that whole community uh, that that is the price of of criticism and what we hope to do is by investigating Uh, these cold cases is to of course um try to bring those to justice that are behind those murders mm. but also to send out a message that uh, murdering a journalist does not always go unpunished yeah exactly yeah. exactly that's very important 
Um, I think that's something we haven't touched upon yet, and maybe you can say a bit more about that. Uh, Gawi was a, a local journalist working in the region. I think we see that more, that they are more vulnerable, that those actually working in the capital have uh, more protection. They're closer to actually the government often. They're closer to, to the power. Um, so it's harder to touch them, I guess. Um, is, there, is that something you've seen in the other investigations that have been done within the project as well? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, it's absolutely right what you're saying. Um, especially, of course, in, in these large countries like India and, and Mexico, the Philippines. These are dangerous contexts for journalists nowadays. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, journalists uh, um, that are outside of the, the limelight of the capital, so to say, are much more, uh, much more vulnerable, absolutely. In Mexico, for example, if you look at certain states, um, journalists have a 50 times higher uh, percentage of chance to get murdered than compared to uh, people in the, in the city center of, of wow. Mexico City. Yeah. Um, so, so then it's very targeted at what they're actually trying to do, they're, what they're trying to reveal, what they're trying to tell. It's not about they're part of a, a system that's actually violent, but they're actually a target uh, because of the work they do. Oh, they're absolutely targeted, of course. That's, that's always, I mean, a problem to prove because one of the issues with journalist murders is that in many cases uh, they don't get solved, right? Mm. Uh, there is impunity. And when there is impunity, there is also this debate, of course, about were they targeted for their work or not. So yeah. we don't always have all the information at hand to prove it, um, but there are ways nowadays, and, and everything indicates that they're targeted for their work. So um, yeah, we're learning more and more about it, and I think that that's safe to conclude. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I wonder, is there any involvement from the family in the investigations you do? Because we saw, obviously, with Kavita, there is a very clear... Um, uh, like uh, motivation to tell the story, to be part of, you know, uh, finding justice for her case. Is that also true for the other um, uh, cases that you've taken up? Yeah, the cases where I, where I work on, there is collaboration with the family, absolutely. Um, yes, and that, that's something that surprises me, or at least not surprises me, that, yeah, that's something to, that inspires me at least, that the family um, often has such a long breath. I mean, you have to imagine that the cases that I work on, um, they're already going on for more than a decade. Uh, yeah. So that means that the family um, uh, has seen a partner being murdered and thereafter has insecurity uh, um, with regards to their own safety, right? I mean, impunity has an effect on the, on the safety of, uh, of the next of kin, basically. So, so that's deeply problematic. Mm -hmm. um, but the cases that I've seen um, uh, the family members are, are very, very, very involved and they're still trying to achieve justice. And if even after 10 years, um, I was speaking to, to someone from Brazil uh, recently uh, and that, that woman told me, the widow told me, I mean, I know I'm not going to get my husband back. I, I know that very much, but I'm doing this for the journalist community. And that was, that was really... That was really meant, and, uh, yeah. and that really that's inspiring. Yeah. Yeah, it is, and it also obviously makes a lot of sense if it's your partner or your father or whoever. Then you're. I think many many times you'll be touched by the work they do, and they are very motivated to do it because if if there's so much danger that they actually get killed for it, then then the the um, kind of situation, the context that they work in must be challenging as well. So you must be really... <laughs> you must be toughened. Exactly, yeah. So um, I can imagine that. Um, what do you think about the role of documentaries like uh, Cavitas uh, for the work that you do? Is that important? Does it help? Um, I mean, without a doubt. Um, so public pressure, I think, is extremely important in these, uh, in these contexts. I mean, um, one of the paradoxical things nowadays is that the places where a lot of murders take place are also democracies, right? Mm. There, there are these countries like India, Mexico, the Philippines. Mm. I mean, perhaps they're imperfect democracies, mm -hmm. um, but the freedom of the press is guaranteed by the constitution, right? So that's, yeah. that's why they're working there. And um, I think there are ways to still um, put pressure on the authorities. And, and if, there is no, if there is no 
information about these murders, then, then that's going to be hard, right? Mm -hmm. So these, these documentaries uh, and, and reporting about this is extremely, extremely important, I think. Yeah, to create the public kind of demand and attention for justice and, uh, yeah. Absolutely, and even, like, for example, even prosecutors, investigators, um, uh, judges, they don't make decisions uh, in a political vacuum, right? No. They're, they're susceptible to public pressure, although they perhaps would not like to admit that. Mm. Um, I think that's still the case, and the signals that we're getting uh, also uh, um, confirms that, I think. Uh, I'm working for the, the same Brazilian case, for example. I was talking with a, with a lawyer. We are having our, our legal strategy there to get access to the case files. Um, and they were asking us as well, can you please also also think about you know creating creating public pressure because yeah. um, that that might that might help. So yeah. therefore, these documentaries might also help, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, to get the attention of the people. Um, do you see any um, hope in the work that you do, like going forward, like what? Um, can we do to support these really courageous journalists and these families that are seeking justice? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, these are not hopeful times, obviously. And, and the, 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 the honest answer is that there is a lot of work to do and things are not going to be, um, are not getting better per se. But the hope is definitely there, mm. especially seeing these family members, uh, um, former colleagues of murdered journalists that, that keep on reporting about it. Um, they seem to have such a long breath and they seem to, uh, to not want to give up. So even in these, de in these times, I, I, I see That's hope inspiring. in that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there are definitely way to help, ways to help, right? I think that um, investigations into, for example, cold, cold cases of murders um, should take place much more often. Um, we should create an environment where um, journalists can also report about murdered journalists. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can think of multiple things that, uh, that are still necessary. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And I think also um, what we've seen in the last couple of years in, in certain, I think the numbers of like totally around the world of journalists killed has gone down a little bit, um, which sounds like things are going better and are improving, but at the same time we've seen many laws being introduced that actually make it easy to uh, lock up any journalist that is critical of uh, those in power. Um, do you see that correlation as well, that, that kind of, uh, they're finding other ways to silence the people that are trying to speak up and, and tell the stories that are not to be heard? Oh, that, that's absolutely the case. I mean, that, that means we're, we're backsliding even more, I think. I mean, yeah. we knew that from before this period, right? I mean, in China or North Korea, we didn't hear much about journalist murders, right? No. I mean, um, that doesn't mean that doesn't take place, but there are good reasons to believe that there are other good measures, namely you can safely put them into prison, yeah. um, or there is a situation where, there is, where it becomes completely unlogical to report about something in the first place. For example, Korea, just to take this as an example of an extremely, extremely yeah. closed place, right? Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, whenever there are murder journalist murders that it's a good sign, of course, um, but it's a sign that uh, there is uncertainty, right? That, yeah. that there is, um, yeah, on the one hand, people still dare to write up to the point that they get murdered for it. Exactly, yeah. Um, so that's something to, uh, that's a nuance to take into account when we look at these murders. Yeah. Uh, therefore, these indexes, I think, are very important. That takes into account uh, both how many journalists are murdered, but also threatened or jailed, for example. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. That was really insightful. Um, I think I'm going to ask everyone who was here before to join me on stage, and then we can see if there's any questions from the, from the audience to you. Oh, if there's any chairs coming. Yeah, they're coming. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I said all this time. Go ahead. Do you want to come closer? Yes. 
<laughs> Thank you. I think there's a mic going around if someone has a, yeah, there's a question over there. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm so deeply moved and um, in much gratitude of your courage and uh, your, the stories that you're putting out into the world. Kavitha, my question is for you. Um, just, gosh, I would love to see the film. Where do, that's my first question, where do we get to see the film? Um, and I just, I loved, your, I'm not usually a fan of voiceover, like the voice of God, but your personal connection to the story and to your sister and, and the, the, the shot of your mother, that scene of your mother speaking to a crowd um, so deeply moved me. I, I um, thank you so much for making this film and for having the courage to do so. But my main question really is, where do we get to see this powerful film that you've made and created? Hopefully soon. Thank you so much for liking it. Uh, I also don't like voiceovers, so I actually decided it should be a personal journey of mine uh, because it's also not just, uh, it was about Gaudi, but it's also my transformation and how I see it. And I thought that would give the connection to the larger audience in terms of, because it's personal. Because I don't want to make a political, it should be political through the personal, I think, that way. So thank you like, for liking it, and I hope you can see it soon. I'm just in the final rough uh, correction and sound, uh, you know, we're just doing the 5.1 and everything. In another month or so, I hope uh, you can get to see it everywhere. Uh, looking for distribution right now. A couple of people have come forward, but I just need to know who can really distribute it. It's not just about money, it's also about reaching out to the maximum number of people across the world. So I hope uh, I find the right uh, company or a person soon, yeah. Yes, please, I'll give you, share you my contact uh, details with you and send you a personal link soon, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions from the room? Yeah. Uh, thank you for these disclosures. It's interesting to me. It's a little bit new to me, actually. I always felt that there was laws that would help the press and that would defend your rights to um, pr produce your work. But you're saying now that many of the countries you represent, these there's new laws? or I mean, how does this change? I don't understand how this can change. Thank you. I think that's a question yes. that all of you might be able to... Anu, can you maybe uh, give oh. a start? Uh, yeah, just to, um, just to start off with uh, the new laws that have been introduced in Bangladesh. It's quite a broad uh, a law that uh, can charge any journalist for reporting on garment affairs. So if we uh, talk about um, the clauses that have been introduced in uh, the media accreditation guidelines in India, if a, a, a journalist writes about uh, a garment affairs, then it can very easily be considered as going against the sovereignty and integrity of the country. So um, in this case, it's easy to charge them. So when, we, when these new laws are um, more broad and uh, are meant to target journalists, we see that journalists uh, self-censor, which is also coming back to what you asked, Yos, um, the, the number of deaths going down doesn't necessarily mean that they have more freedom. It simply means that they're scared for, for their lives and their jobs. So they are going on self-censoring. Um, and the Kashmir uh, situation now is still quite um, uh, worrisome uh, because there are new um, levels of content regulation uh, that the uh, media outlets have to do, which is now leading to media outlets just shutting. For example, uh, a very uh, leading daily called Kashmir Times had to close down. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, I understand a little bit, uh, but... It really targets journalists. So how do you define a journalist? How do you define a yes. journalist? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tricky one. Yeah. Yes, do you? Uh, it, it really depends, right? I, I think this is one of the main, main issues for everyone. Um, 
I think obviously a journalist reports about some something of public interest that that at the first at, in the first place, whether case by case someone is a journalist or not. I think it depends on the context. I think, for example, in the Netherlands, it's not a protected profession. I think there are countries where it is a profession where it's more more um, more yeah. clear and it's it's easier to de define someone as a journalist. Um, but yeah, one of the things I think we're also dealing with is that, of course, it's not. I mean, the people that are targeted are not always um, the, the stereotypical uh, journalist. I mean, they're also, I mean, I think they're most, it's, it's about the fact that they, they bear information with them, right? Compromising information that they want to spread in some sort of meaningful way. Um, so they can also be information activists. Uh, right to information activists in India are also, is a subgroup of people that is also targeted. These are not... Uh, per se, journalists, but they have a similar function, right? They report about something of public interest, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if I can continue, Jan journalists is anybody that brings information forward. But I think today we're very specifically talking about investigative journalists or those that, uh, that report on government affairs. They can be photojournalists, um, fashion journalists, but they don't face the same threat that an investigative journalist, uh, for example, faces. Um, in Pakistan, for example, when there was the Me Too movement, it was very easy to uh, uh, call a journalist um, and, and you know, uh, charge them under libel uh, for defaming a politician or a celebrity or a leader. Um, so it also started to slowly go over uh, and cross the borders of investigative journalism in certain cases. Um, but I, I yeah. <laughs> and uh, I can see that there are similar patterns with Afghanistan as well. So we have a few journalists, uh, most of them international uh, media representatives who are in Kabul and who uh, receive attention from uh, uh, the uh, whole international community and the other uh, activists inside the country. But then we have citizens, community members, who report on, on uh, uh, things happening around the country, who are not necessarily a professional uh, associated with a station, mm -hmm. but more like uh, in a border between activism and reporting. Um, and uh, uh, it turns out that this uh, uh, um, pattern specifically uh, somehow treats the Taliban. They don't go uh, after uh, big names, they don't go after uh, established journalists, but rather they would go to uh, the community members uh, who are not professionals, but who contribute uh, uh, on, on first-hand reporting from the things happening there. Mm -hmm. And I can say I was uh, moved with uh, my colleague uh, uh, Zaki's speech. Uh, uh, maybe I'm slightly a bit more um, not optimistic in this term. He was talking about hope and he was talking about uh, 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 the media that 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 hasn't uh, been uh, uh, the media that's not yet destroyed. Um, I when I heard to Z uh, when I heard Zeki, I um, I realized that I have been missing uh, to to mention these individuals like Zeki and his team who have been reporting about Afghanistan. But uh, in fact, I still do believe that there is nothing as independent journalism exists in Afghanistan anymore, rather individuals who, who are willing to take risk and who are willing to continue this path for reporting. And uh, uh, I was so moved to hear that Zeki, as a journalist, is talking about hope, mm -hmm. while we are all, this is something we're all looking for, but we can't really find that. Mm -hmm. So on that regard, it makes me hopeful as well to see that there are individual voices who maybe in the future find ways uh, to, to report from the country. But I do really echo on, uh, on, on Zeki's request from uh, Free Press Unlimited to, to come to Afghanistan. This is the moment that we need the most, uh, that we need uh, this international recognition as, as uh, the people and as the uh, community of activists who really need that. And uh, it also, uh, when you asked me, Evelyn, about whether I, I'm planning to return or not, uh, uh, Right now, I don't belong there because mm. my community doesn't <coughs> exist there. 
my family doesn't exist, uh, uh, the uh, professional community that I was a part of uh, doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if organizations like Free Press Unlimited and, and other organizations that support uh, 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 um, the freedom of expression and journalism, if they do go to the country, this gives us a reason to at least uh, feel that we are a part of something and at least feel that there will be someone who would raise voice if, mm. if we are in danger. Mm. So this gives us like a sense of being connected to a, a, a yeah. broader uh, community and not alone anymore. So yeah. I, I really echo on Zeki on that regard. Great, noted. Um, just a follow-up question on that. For you as a filmmaker, is it different or do you experience the same? Like the, when you were back in Afghanistan, did you experience a lot of um, threats or anything related to what we talked about that these independent journalists face? Well, yeah, this somehow uh, relates to the question that you ask, whether who is journalist, because in Afghanistan context, usually filmmakers are considered as journalists as well, because they have a camera and they talk to the people. Mm. But uh, there are lots of, like, uh, there were lots of technical uh, issues that we would face as, as people who would uh, uh, spend more time with the characters and with the stories rather than daily or weekly reports. Uh, but the whole context was the same. Uh, uh, but right now, uh, it really doesn't matter w whether you are a filmmaker or whether you are a journalist. As soon as you have a camera, you are automatically considered as a threat. Mm. But there is, just to mention, there is a small number of YouTubers uh, who report, but there is nothing critic about that. You know, it's all about, <laughs> the, uh, you know, mm, traveling uh, yeah. in the roads that were unsafe before. And just, you know, the very human uh, uh, um, right to just uh, talk with the people without being treated. Mm. Um, we can see the country from that lens, but there's nothing critical about it. There's mm. no real reporting. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Is there more questions from the so, so room? I, if you don't mind, I have one no, more question. Of course. <clears throat> I'm, as all of you are journalists, I'm wondering, I had a career for 40 years doing electronic controls, and of course, we challenged many things about safety and making things better, and I mean, that's how we all made our careers and got successful. I'm wondering in journalism, is there a line <clears throat> that you can see where you're maybe not being thought to be safe, that you're going to cross this line? Because I think many times I've challenged generals of the military and the heads of Boeing and challenged them on their approaches, but I never felt there would be threats against me. Mm. And I, I wonder if in journalism, do you know this, that there is a line, that you see this line, that you mm. know you shouldn't cross it, or in your own situations? Are you taught this? Elias, I think, is uh, the best It's person. totally different in Afghanistan context because uh, reporting, journalism, storytelling is never a, a, a career choice for us. It's uh, not something that we want to do for a living. Of course, we earn money with that, but at the end of the day, it's a struggle to survive. It's a mean of, of expression. So... Um, the question of safety never comes first for us. It comes on the very last minute before uh, uh, releasing uh, that, that we just sit down for a minute and think about uh, our safety. But nothing about reporting in Afghanistan is safe. For the films that we uh, make right now, uh, every step that we take out of our office and out of our, our home is, is totally unsafe for us. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, I've been working on a documentary for the past um, nearly five years. It starts with a suicide, actually, a young girl, a student of Kabul University committing suicide. So for the past five years, we are um, following this story, but at the same time, we needed to evacuate the whole nine members of the family so that we, could, we would be able to patch, present and release the film later this year. So uh, the question of, of security is the first question that comes, but it is the last question that we deal with because it's the reality.
Mm. I can say from, from the Free Press Unlimited perspective, I think it has become a lot more prominent in the work that we do. So in supporting independent media and journalists, I think about six years ago, it was a topic we, we did work on, but I think now it's the main topic we do work on. So we have these emergency funds, we have these legal funds to defend journalists. We, um, especially with you know these crises in, in Ukraine, in Afghanistan, these are our contexts where we work. And we see that there's a huge demand for, for safety for, for journalists, for them to go out and for emergency visas when they've reported on something that's very sensitive. Um, it's very sad, of course. It says something about the, the kind of polarization and the position they're in within society. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you also a bit about this because I think it's something we also see in the investigations that um, there are kind of red lines. Maybe you can elaborate a bit on this. Yeah, but at the same time, I think it's, it's always, these red lines are often very blurry, unfortunately. Um, I mean, perhaps in some contexts there are red lines and actually we, we, have, we have certain cases where that seems to be the case when, uh, when, we write about, when journalists write about a specific um, really influential family, for example, uh, everybody knows that that will have consequences. But generally speaking, these, these red lines are more blurry than we would maybe like to think, because otherwise, otherwise why uh, would there be so many journalists murdered in the end, right? I mean, um, most of these journalists, I would say, um, do not expect to get murdered. Um, there are some, I've, I've spoken actually to journalists that predicted that something would happen to them. Uh, but many actually think, no, it will not happen to me. I'm, I'm on the right side of the red line. And unfortunately, these red lines uh, shift all the time. Uh, things can escalate, things can get worse. Um, so unfortunately, um, we shouldn't rely on these red lines too much. Mm. Kavita, you wanted to add to that? No, in India, of course, Gauri was offered, you know, security by the government when she thought she had some kind of a threat. Well, she laughed it off, saying it's not really a threat mm -hmm. as such. But when she was offered, she said, which kind of, uh, you know, a journalist would actually go with government security mm. to do any investigative journalism or anything at all? Because yeah. she was always against the government, whichever mm. the party was, especially, of course, the BJP and the RSS. But... Really, a, no rightful journalist would go with a platoon of uh, security yeah. <laughs> given by the government. Uh, so I think, uh, and also there's been a lot of censorship uh, ourselves in terms of as a filmmaker or even as a journalist in India because the kind of slap cases that are being slapped on you. When Gauri died, she had about 85 cases on her. So that's a lot. So they try to keep them <clears throat> active, just attending these cases in remote places, you know. So she's not ready to write, she has no time to write or really do any groundwork, mm. but she's attending these cases. But one good thing she did was, she made her own kind of uh, friends and whole, uh, what do you call, uh, a group of like-minded people who would again fight for the constitution, secure them in each little town she went to. So that was the beauty of her, she took that opportunity to do that. But how many people can really do that? Right now, The Wire, for instance, has been slapped with 100 crore, uh, you know, by the Ambani's or, you know, people like that all the time. So where do they have time to really to work peacefully yeah. at actual information or investigative journalism, but instead of attending these court cases all the time? So, yeah. And filmmakers, of course, there's been, we have something called censorship in India. So some of the films don't get censored in, at all, so that it, you, you, know, you can't release the film, especially if it's against the government. Yeah. So, or if it's pro-government, like the one which is right now very popular, the Kashmir Files, is being completely propagated by the government because it's, it, it, it fits in with their agenda. So, mm. yeah. yeah. So, goes but on. I think also security is not only physical security now, it's quite broad in this uh, current context. Um, we also have to think about digital security, and um, then speaking of digital security, then the red line is always very much closer to you. Um, in Pakistan, we have uh, uh, journalists reporting uh, that uh, their social media accounts were uh, hacked or there were attempts made. And massive trolling of female journalists, especially a study showed, um, a study that was done by UNESCO and ICJ, showed three out of four women report um, 
online uh, violence. So they, they've experienced uh, death threats, rape threats. And then one in five women um, respondents said that there were physical attacks made on them, or made on them uh, because of incidents that seeded online. Um, so now it's, it's getting more and more closer and real, and it can attack you even at home. Um, I think we also have to consider the trauma, the PTSD that journalists go through. It's, it's very real. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think also the sad thing about this, I think in the same uh, study it also showed that it led to a certain portion of these journalists to actually leave the profession mm -hmm. because of all of this, mm -hmm. which, um, yeah, I think is a really sad consequence yeah. that they don't get to speak out anymore. Any more questions at this point? <laughs> yeah. more, sorry. No, go ahead. I'm also now thinking about, as you talk about this red line, uh, how do you now um, define truth? when there's activities going on and, and maybe you don't want to report it completely the way it, you saw it, but maybe twist it a little bit to try to stay inside this red line. Mm -hmm. So how does truth now get defined in this world where journalists are sort of living in this uh, threatening world? I'm not sure who of you wants to uh, <laughs> <Who dares>? answer. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, well, I, I come from a country where truth is not really reliable, especially when you hear it from the mainstream media. In fact, the mainstream media has uh, shaped the whole narrative of the war and the way that the world looks at us. So <clears throat> on that regard, I would say, the, at least personally for me, the best way to preserve the truth would be to give voice to the peoples from within the community, to give voice uh, uh, for the inner voices of the community and, and, and to the locals who uh, live uh, and experience on a daily basis what's going on, rather than having, I can say, a heli view, a helicopter view towards the people who are living there. Uh, which, every time that I talk uh, about my film and, and about things happening, I always uh, attack the mainstream media because I, we have suffered a lot from how they have reported and how they have shaped us uh, uh, to the world. So on that regard, uh, um, having being able to, to talk about ourselves without uh, uh, having this uh, um, perspective of outside installed on, on, on the frame, I think that's how I, I would approach the truth. In, in journalism, a local and insider view to the things happening. Mm. I'm myself not a journalist. Um, I work with journalists um, in implementing uh, projects in, from FBU uh, in repressive uh, countries. So, uh, the, so I cannot answer the question of um, truth, but I think that um, when free press is uh, the freedom of press is dismantled by laws and regulations by an individual official, I think they take away the the only weapon that the public have against corruption and um, and abuse of power. So um, the idea is to just keep fighting and to provide a, a very supportive environment to the journalists that are still there and reporting. And um, reporting from Afghanistan is becoming more and more difficult because there is not uh, any resources left to to, to approach to, to confirm the stories that you are working. Uh, and there is a debate ongoing uh, in social media about uh, the fake news and the uh, news that you could rely on. And some pro-Taliban media activists uh, suggest that every news that has been confirmed by the government, so-called government, should be considered as, as, as the truth. Uh, while we are uh, dealing with a government uh, whose roots are, are, are based on, on, on lies and, and based on uh, 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 anything but not the truth. So... Uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to find the truth. Similarly, I think in India, most of the major newspapers are being owned by corporate firms and, you know, 
So the corporates, the corporates are always in cahoots with the go- whichever the ruling government is. So it's becoming earlier, at least there used to be some kind of a sea page, as they call, of information or corruption, a little space. But right now it's been covered completely. If you take a newspaper, there's articles from the running government covered by them all over the newspaper. And there, of course, the television channels, which are owned by corporates. So it's what they're basically becoming like the pamphlets, mm. you know, handouts of the government. So s- similar to what you said, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. If there are no more questions, I'm going to ask you if you have any final comments before we close. Any hopeful comments, maybe even more. <laughs> Well, perhaps one final comment is that, or at least from my side, is that what, what sometimes strikes me, I'm, I'm also not a journalist, by the way, but what, um, what I like to take as an example of, of, of something that gives me hope is that, for example, in contexts like Mexico, there's so much violence taking place. Uh, so many journalists get either murdered or, or disappear, for example. But what really surprises me sometimes is that the, the, the amount of people that are, remain defiant and remain to publish about uh, matters of public interest, corruption, embezzlement. Um, and that defiance really, I think, is, is, um, is something that gives hope, yeah. Yeah, their courage and their uh, perseverance, mm. yeah. I agree. Well, let's close with that. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the speakers, and uh, thank you. Thank you.